We're going to be in Hebrews chapter 13 this evening. Hebrews chapter 13. <clears throat> Go ahead and turn there. We're actually going to be covering the the entire chapter here, Lord willing, tonight. We've got a lot of ground to cover. Hebrews chapter 13. Thank you all for being here tonight. Um, Hard as it is to believe, after only a few uh, short years, it seems, in the book of Hebrews, we are drawing it to a close. Um, I've mentioned before, we started this back in January of 2020. I I started it. We we started it together, and certainly I realize that probably none of you have been here for all of them. Maybe maybe a few of you. Uh, Probably Eric, you've probably been here for all of them, (laughs) Uh, because he always sings that song that puts the knot in my stomach right before I get up to preach, which is awfully nice of him. Um, But you know, in in a strange way, um, you know, he he asked earlier if you know we were ready to go and, and all that kind of stuff, and I said, yeah, you know, it's a little sad, honestly. Um, I've, I've really enjoyed this series. I've enjoyed working our way through the book of Hebrews. We haven't, certainly haven't talked about everything we could talk about in this book, uh, but we're very thankful for the ground that we've been able to cover and, and hopefully some things that all of us can take away. And we're going to try and put a little bit of a bow on it tonight um, in, in the conclusion of the book, really, as, as is what this is, is what this final chapter is here. Um, but before we begin, why don't I go ahead and pray and we'll... And we'll get started here this evening. Lord, we do ask that you would meet with us tonight. Father, I pray that you would anoint my lips by your spirit. Lord, I pray that I would say only the things that you would have for me to say tonight. Lord, that these would not be uh, man's words. Lord, that you would encourage hearts tonight. You would challenge us from your word. As the author of the book of Hebrews wraps up um, this wonderful book, Lord, I pray that um, our hearts would be encouraged pray that we would uh, see the message that he has for us, that your word has for us, that you have for us. And we pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Um, The title of our message tonight, excuse me, is One Last Thing. One Last Thing. And preachers are uh, famous, well-known for saying things like, as we conclude this evening, and then going on for another 20 or 30 minutes. They do this at camp a lot, okay? At camp, they preach for like a solid 70, 80 minutes every night. And it's, it's great. And these guys, some of these guys that preach at camp are uh, the, some of the best preachers you're ever going to hear. And, and they, they're, they're amazing storytellers. Um, and, and it doesn't seem like it's taking that long. But they'll say, as we conclude, and then they'll go on for another 20 or 30 minutes. And I'm sure you've heard. Uh, thankfully, that doesn't happen a whole lot here, I don't think. Um, but a few years ago, I had been asked to uh, give a graduation speech, which I was ex- very excited to do, something that I had, had never done before, and I really had no idea what I was doing. And so for a few months or, or so, a few months or so, leading up to that graduation uh, day, I would just, you know, as I was doing whatever, whatever I was doing, I would just always be thinking, you're all, you know how this goes, you're always thinking about stuff, and especially preachers, we're always thinking about that next thing that's coming up, or next message, or whatever, and, and so I would kind of have this on my mind, this graduation speech, you know, that I knew I was going to have to give, and I just didn't, I, I really didn't know what I was going to share, and I'd kind of come to a theme uh, of kindness, I want to share about kindness, and just being kind uh, in, in, in this world where so few are, are not, or so, so few are kind, um, but as I led up to that graduation, as I thought of things, you know, just randomly, I would just write things down, anything that came to mind that I wanted to share, that I wanted to uh, tell these young people. And as it turned out, there was a whole lot uh, that I wanted to share. I, you know, of course, you, you don't know when you're going to have that kind of opportunity again. And we're talking about a, a good number of graduates um, and that were moving on and, and taking this huge step in their lives. And of course, I recognize none of you, you, you might not even remember if you had a graduation speaker at your graduation, let alone who it was or what they said, okay? Um, so I, I fully recognize that. But I really wanted to give this some, some thought and prayer. And so as I did, I, I you know, my list of things got longer and longer. Um, you know, these kids, they're, they're effectively stepping out onto, into life uh, on their own, and, and it's a huge transition. And I just kept thinking of things that I wanted them to know, things that I thought maybe I would have, it would have been good if I would have known this. And so a day or two before uh, graduation, I'm, you know, I'm putting my finishing touches on the speech and um, practicing my speech for, for Danielle which she was very kind, kind enough to, to listen to and, um, and give me some feedback. And when I'm done, she says something along the lines of, of this, which was, it was, and it was very kind, but she said, you know, that was, that was great, um, but I don't know, what, what was all that stuff at the end? 
What was all, all those? You kind of added a bunch of stuff there at the end that didn't really seem to have a whole lot to do with the, the, the kindness theme. It's, it seemed like you were trying to cram in a bunch of stuff there right at the end. And I said, yeah, <laughs> that's kind of the idea. That's what I was trying to do. And she, again, very kindly said, uh, you, you probably shouldn't do that. That's probably not going to work. And as it turned out, she was very, very correct in that. It would have been very awkward if I had tried to move through 13 different topics in the last five minutes of my speech. Um, and, and, and of course, you know, I, again, I explained to her that though I had a lot of things, I had a lot of things I wanted to tell them and a lot of things to get across. Uh, but then of course I removed several paragraphs from my speech, uh, because I knew she was probably right. And my, it was already sufficiently long anyway. Um, and it seems that the author of Hebrews has a, a similar problem here in the, in the last chapter. As we were coming to this last chapter, chapter 13 of Hebrews, as I began to study this several weeks ago and began looking at this chapter, I thought, oh, mercy. I mean, I mean, how, how are we going to make an outline of this? How are we going to come away? I mean, how, how does this congeal in, in any, any possible way? It seems that he has a very similar issue. He's got all kinds of things on his mind. He really wants to get them all out before he finishes this letter. Um, and so while our title is One Last Thing, there's actually quite a few different uh, things that are covered in this last chapter. There's very little, I'll just say this from the outset, there's very little uh, new information. There's not a lot of new material, new instructions that he's giving in this chapter, but it's more like a collection of final reminders that he's giving to his audience. And in, a t- in an attempt to somehow divide things out here for the sake of an outline, I've, I've grouped these, these final exhortations into three uh, somewhat broad categories. You see that on your on your outline this evening. Uh, and the first is these final exege- excuse me ethical not exegetical ethical exhortations. Let's look together at verse one. We'll read the first several verses here together as he offers these exhortations. Number first one: Let brotherly love continue. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing some have unwittingly entertained angels. Remember the prisoners as they've chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. Verse 4, marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Let your conduct be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of of their conduct. Uh, and you know how when you're a, a child, uh, once you get to be old enough that you can be left at home for a short amount of time on your own, um, then what happens when mom leaves? Well, any number of things might happen. But before she leaves, she's going to say something along the lines of, hey, while I'm gone, do this, this, and this, right? Uh, or most likely more like, don't do this, this, and this, right? She'll, she's going to give you some, some final instructions. While I'm gone, I don't, want to, I don't want any fighting, okay? I don't want you guys fighting, if you have siblings, of course. Um, I don't want you to turn on the stove, right? Don't cook anything. Uh, at least this is what my mom said. I don't know, y'all are looking at me like you don't have moms. Um, she said, she'd say things like, don't open the door for anyone. Um, don't eat all the ice cream in the freezer. Um, you know, all that kind of stuff, right? And she would give you these final exhortations before she left the house to ensure your excellent behavior while she's gone. And that's almost the feeling that we're getting here, uh, as he gives this kind of laundry list of final exhortations, ethical exhortations, as we'll see here, um, for his audience as he wraps up the letter. First, he says, let, let brotherly love continue. Hey, love one another. And we've grouped the, these first three verses all together. Love one another. They all carry the same idea that we should be demonstrating love to one another. Again, he says as, mu- he says as much uh, spe- explicitly in verse 1. And then in verse 2, we have the familiar exhortation towards hospitality. And the word he uses here really has the idea, it says in, in the New King James, entertain strangers. Do not forget to, forget to entertain strangers. And has the idea of, of loving strangers, of, of loving people that you don't know. You know, in our world today, if you're traveling somewhere, if you're going to a place that you don't know someone, or at least not someone that you're comfortable staying with, perhaps, what do you do? You book a hotel, right? 
You go on Priceline, you name your own price, you do whatever you got to do. To, you, you get a hotel uh, wherever you're going. If you're very cool and trendy, of course, you might book an Airbnb or something like that. Uh, but, of course, we know at this time in history, that was not an option, okay? You couldn't do that kind of thing. Um, you know, you, these things did not exist. You couldn't go online and book a room at the Jerusalem Holiday Inn or anything like that and, 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 or the uh, Best Middle Eastern. Okay, uh, the author of Hebrews here emphasizes in these verses that we, as believers, these folks, they had a, uh, an obligation towards hospitality because this was, you know, th- this would have been necessary for those traveling in that, um, in that time. And of course, he, he references those who have unwittingly entertained angels unawares. Right, who have entertained angels. And no doubt he's referring, of course, to the account in Genesis chapter 18 of Abraham entertaining angels without realizing at first. Uh, that's Gen- in Gen- we're not going to look at it tonight, but that's Genesis chapter 18, verses uh, 1 through 15. Now, I'm not going to do a, a, a deep dive tonight into this verse. We, we really need to press forward. Um, and, and some would ask, well, do we still entertain angels unaware? And that's a good question. I'm not sure I have a, a definitive answer on that. It's possible for, for sure, but I would just note that uh, when he says here, uh, he's, he does not say that you will entertain angels unaware. He's making a statement of fact. He's saying that some have, okay? And that's certainly just one, something I wanted to point out. But it's certainly possible that we even today perhaps would entertain angels, but I'm not, I'm not saying that tonight. I'm just saying what he is saying in this passage is that some have done this, okay? And, and it's not a guarantee that it's going to happen to us. But in any case, it's something for us to be aware of, and we certainly should be demonstrating hospitality to one another. In verse 3, he says to remember, to help, to assist, to provide for an active response to the needs of the prisoners as they've chained with them. Again, all of this falling under the umbrella of loving one another. We have that in verses 1 through 3. Then he gives us the exhortation to walk in purity. Verse 4, marriage is honorable among all and the bed is undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. And certainly in our world today, the reality is that the majority of the world marriage is not held in honor. In fact, many think, why would you get married? What's the point? Why tie yourself down to one person? The author here reminds us that marriage is honorable. Why is marriage honorable? What is it about? I mean, it's just, is it just what we do? Well, no, certainly not. I mean, marriage is honorable among all, and the bed is undefiled because it was God's idea. Because God set up marriage. It was his idea in the first place, and right from Genesis chapter 1. He created it. And he warns here, the author of Hebrews warns here, that fornicators and adulterers, which is basically an all-encompassing uh, term here for any kind of sexual sin at all, will be judged. Judged. Those who deviate from God's plan will suffer uh, great consequences. And then in verses 5 and 6, he says, to be content with such things as you have. Pastor Randy mentioned these verses this morning. Um, Paul as well in Philippians chapter 4. We read the verses here in Hebrews already, but Paul as well in Philippians chapter 4. He says not in verse 11, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned that whatsoever, whatever state I am, I am to be what? To be content. And that is exactly what he is exhorting us to. This is, of course, in the uh, text uh, uh, right, right before the most often taken out of verse in all the Bible, Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What is he actually saying that you can do through Christ who strengthens you? Well, he's saying that you know how to be full and how to be hungry and how to abound and to suffer need. I don't think that many people who use this verse uh, in the ways that they traditionally do are thinking about that. That's not really what they're saying uh, when they're saying, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And Paul's talking about being content. The all things through Christ who strengthens me that he is enabled to do is to be content in whatever state he is in. And that's exactly what the author of Hebrews is exhorting us to do here. He says, let your conduct be without covetousness and be content. The opposite of covetousness is what? Contentment. The opposite of covetousness, of looking and and desiring and and, and lusting after even things that are not ours, that, that do not belong to us, is contentment. The antidote to covetousness is contentment. Being content with such things as you have. And it's almost as if he is saying, God has said, and he quotes from Joshua chapter 1, verse 5 here, he says, it's almost as if God has said, hey, I will never leave you nor forsake you. What, could you, what else could you possibly need? Can you not be content with me? I will never leave you nor forsake you. And so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. He quotes from Psalm 118, verse 6, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? 
So he says to walk in purity. He says to be content with what we what we have. He says for us to love one another. He also says for us to submit to leadership. You look at verse seven. Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Then look also at verse uh, seventeen. He almost uh, it's interesting. He kind of bookends this this section here with two verses about leadership. It actually comes up. Uh, three, ver- uh, three times in this passage, we'll look at the last one later, but in verse 17, verse 7, he talks about remembering, almost as if these are people who have already passed on. And then in verse 17, he says, Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy. Let those who, gi- who must give an account, let them give an account with joy and, and not with grief. For that would be unprofitable for you. This is a stronger exhortation here than in in verse 17 than in verse 7. In verse 7 he says to remember. In verse 17 he says to obey and to be submissive. For they watch out for your souls. Uh, Etymologically, the the origin of the words here, watch out, it has the idea of of actually uh, chasing away sleep. It doesn't mean that that's exactly what the word means, but it's probably in there. Uh, of chasing away sleep. Why, why would we be chasing away sleep, watching out for souls? Well, perhaps these are those who have, who have even lost sleep in, in prayer, lost sleep because of the anguish of soul, because of those who have wandered far from, from the Lord. And he says to do what? To obey them, to be submissive uh, to them, to submit to, um, to leadership as those who must give an account, so that they may do so with joy, he says, and not with grief. Be submissive. Who are the people in our lives who are going to give an account for us? Who who, who are the people in your life that are going to give an account for you? Uh, Perhaps parents, perhaps a pastor. um, Be mindful of them. Remember them. Obey them. Submit uh, to them. So as he's signing off here, he offers these ethical or behavioral reminders to his audience regarding how they should be living. Um, And of course, the same injunctions apply to us as well today. In the following section, he offers theological reminders. Let's look at verses 8 uh, through 12 here as we begin this section, these theological reminders. Uh, Verse 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines, for it is good that the heart be established by grace, not with foods which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat, for the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. That is, of course the gates of Jerusalem. His exhortation, the theological exhortation that, that, and reminder that he gives us here is that, is that we must stand firm in Christ. And this is, again, this is not new. Okay? He has made a big deal about this throughout the entire book. First of all, why? Why should you do this? He says in verse 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus Christ is God, and he does not change. Why should we... Why, why should we stand firm in Christ? Why should we persevere? Why should we continue on? Because you have an unchanging, superior sacrifice. This verse 8, we, we all know this verse, and it really serves as a, uh, as a transition between these two statements that he's going to give in the, what, be, be, between verse 7 and what he's going to say in verses 9 through 12. Um, it's, also, it's almost as if he's saying, your, your Savior doesn't change, so you don't change either. Keep doing what you're doing. Uh, he's not going to change. He's not going to change his mind. He's not going to change the way things are done. And that's what he's about to tell them in verse 9. He says, do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines. Essentially, he's saying, stick to the stuff. Keep doing what you know to be doing is right. Stay, w- stay the course. Stay with Christ. And in a very real way, what he's exhorting them to is, to, is towards the gospel. Towards Christ towards not going back to Judaism, towards not going back to the old way of doing things, but towards the true gospel of Jesus Christ, who is the only way of salvation. That is what he is exhorting them to not stray from, not to stray with these various and strange uh, doctrines. 
Paul gives a similar uh, uh, exhortation in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. Like we're, we're, we're light and we just go carried around with whatever, uh, you know, whatever the next thing that comes along is. And there are a lot of people like this, even in churches today, who whenever the next thing comes along, we just kind of kind of, oh, well, that sounds pretty good. I guess I'll go over here and do that. Oh, well, that sounds pretty good. We'll just move over to that. And he says, no, don't do that. He says, don't be carried about by various and strange doctrines, tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men and cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. He says, don't be carried about with these various and strange doctrines. Be established by grace. The grace of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He says to stand firm in that. Now, in verse 10, we might be tempted to think that this altar that he's referring to uh, is the Lord's table. But I don't believe that's what he's referring to. He says in verse 10, we have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. And it's actually much more likely that he's using, that he's describing the whole of the sacrifice of Christ by referring to a part, uh, a part. So the altar that he's referring to in verse 10, we have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. The altar is the altar of sacrifice, which in this case is the cross of Christ. That is the altar that Christ was sacrificed on. And those who have no right to eat of it are those who are still clinging to Judaism. Remember, again, that the, 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 one of the main purposes of the book of Hebrews is to convince these Jews, he's writing to Jews who have converted from Judaism to continue on in the face of persecution and ridicule from those who are still inside the camp. He's going to talk here in just a moment about those who are outside of the camp. In fact, let's look together at verse, uh, verses 13 through 16. He says, therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp. Outside the gates of Jerusalem, that is who he's referring to, is Jesus Christ. Outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. We're not worried about a physical city here. We're worried about the eternal city, the new Jerusalem, the, the, the eternal city that is to come. Therefore, verse 15, what are we supposed to do? Therefore, let us come con, uh, continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. So why should we stand firm in Christ? First, because he's an unchanging Savior. We have a superior, an unchanging superior sacrifice in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. How is it that we go about doing this? How is it that we stand firm in Christ? He says, go. Go forth to him. Outside the camp. I believe here he's referring to the camp of, of Judaism, those who are still inside the camp, who are still practicing Judaism, who have not realized the freedom that is found in Jesus Christ, who are still holding to the old way of doing things that he has spent chapter after chapter after chapter, chapter showing that Jesus is better, that his sacrifice is superior, that his high priesthood is a thousand times better than any earthly high priest that ever walked the face of the earth. These are the message. These, this is what we've been talking about. He's bringing it all to a conclusion here. He says, go to him. This is an interesting phrase he uses. He says, go forth outside the camp. And I, again, I believe he's referencing that Jesus was crucified outside the gates of Jerusalem. And the fact that these Jewish Christians were now outside the camp of Jerusalem. Because now they were, had abandoned, uh, excuse me, they're outside the camp of Judaism. They had abandoned Judaism. This really is, is the climax of the conclusion here. He's encouraging these people to go to Christ, to, to embrace him, to embrace the gospel, to embrace Jesus as the only way of salvation. Because now that he was available, he was the only way. No one was going to be saved. No one was ever saved by offering a sacrifice. No, one was, no one's sins were ever forgiven. And he's talked at length about the true and real forgiveness that is found only in Jesus Christ. And he says, go. Go to him. Embrace him. Embrace everything that is in Christ, including his reproach. He says, bearing his reproach in verse 13. How also do we do this? By offering our own sacrifices. In verse 15 and, verses 15 and 16, we see this. He says, let us then continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. 
giving thanks to his name. First, we have the sacrifice of praise. So since these folks are no longer offering physical sacrifices, they're no longer slaughtering lambs, there's no longer animals that are being sacrificed on altars and blood that is being spilt uh, that for, for these people because they are clinging to Christ. They have gone to Christ. They have gone to the Lord and, and, and they are clinging to him in Christ. Now they can offer spiritual sacrifices. No longer offering physical sacrifices, but their own spiritual sacrifice. First, the sacrifice of praise. Let us continue to offer the sacrifice of praise. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. I think most obviously, first, first, this is in our prayer, of course, praying to God, thanking him, and a sacrifice of thanksgiving, of praying and, and thanking God uh, for the wonderful things that he's given us. But I believe also that we uh, sometimes miss that this also, I mean, these sacrifices were done publicly, um, they were done in the, in the temple, in the tabernacle. Um, and I believe the sacrifice also could be offered in, uh, to, to one another. Uh, sacrifice of praise to one another and praising God in front, of, uh, in front of others. How often do we take the opportunity to praise the Lord when we, when we receive a blessing? Um, to take the chance to say, wow, God has been so good to us. I mean, every, every single week we put out a prayer sheet and every week we have, uh, most every week, we have praises that are on that prayer sheet. And, 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 you know, it does sometimes strike me that, that we have so many prayer requests, but so few praises. Why is that? And I think that's just the, the general nature of, hu- is just a general human nature that once a prayer is answered, it, it is so against our, our general human nature to go back and just thank the Lord for that. I mean, how many prayers? Think about all the years. Some of you have been Christians for a very, very long time. All the years of prayers that you have prayed. And all the times that God has answered those prayers. I mean, think about that. How many countless thousands of prayers has the Lord answered? And how often, how often did we bring that request before God? We are, we are much quicker to bring the request than to thank Him for it once it's actually uh, answered. And I think we also miss an opportunity in not thanking God publicly. And saying things like, wow, God has been so good to us, hasn't he? Of course, we say churchy things like that at church, right? I mean, that's not hard, right? Uh, We can do that here. We can say praise the Lord and amen and all that kind of stuff here at church because that's what we do. We do churchy things at church. But listen, how often do you say that kind of stuff at home? I mean, are your kids, like if you said something like that, the kind of thing you say here at church, like praise, wow, amen, brother, praise the Lord. That's good to hear. That's an answer to prayer and all those kinds of things. What are your kids going to think about that? I mean, what, what, if you said something like that at home, would that just floor them? Would they say, why are you talking like that? You don't say that kind of stuff. Or is that really, is that truly the way you talk? Do you really truly give praise to God and thank him publicly? Bear testimony to how good he has been. At the very least, I think it's imperative that, that we speak this way to our children. That we let them hear, God is good. Isn't this a wonderful day that he's made for us? That ought to be a natural thing that's coming out of our mouth, that we naturally take the time to praise the Lord, that we even pray and say, Lord, thank you. Thank you for this. And and we give praise to him. And we we recognize, we we keep that before our children, that they hear us praising God for his goodness to us. So we have a sacrifice of praise. Also a sacrifice, I've just called this a sacrifice of of benevolence. He says to to do good and to share. Um, This really does sound like mom's last words before she heads out the door. Do good, share, okay? Be good, right? Share your toys, do what you're supposed to do. James also gives a similar exhortation in James chapter 1. Pure and undefiled religion. He defines pure and undefiled religion here. Before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. To visit orphans and widows in their their trouble, in their affliction. How often are we doing that? Are we offering a sacrifice of benevolence? Are we doing good? Are we sharing? For he says, with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. No longer are God's people called to sacrifice animals and blood. Now we are called to sacrifice ourselves for the good of those around us. And of course, Romans chapter 12, um, verse 1 comes to mind. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present yourself a living sacrifice. That is the sacrifice that we are called to offer today. This final section here this evening, he gives us some practical considerations. It's a very uh, typical closing to a book. I'm not going to say a a whole lot about this for sake of time, but look at verse 18. 
We already looked at verse 17 with the exhortation to uh, obey and submit to leadership. But verse 18, pray for us, uh, for we are confident that we have a good conscience in all things desiring to live honorably. But I especially urge you to do this, that I may be restored to you the sooner. It's perhaps uh, it's certainly possible that the author of Hebrews, again, we, we don't know who this is, uh, but he gives a closing appeal here in verses 18 and 19. He says, pray for us. He asks his audience, his listeners, to, to pray. I would say that this, these last several verses uh, of the book of Hebrews are probably the only place in the entire book, really, that I'm tempted to think this could be Paul. Uh, because it sounds very Paulish. Uh, these these final words, a very typical closing to a book, though. Uh, New Testament books f- conclude this way. Um, almost always the New Testament epistles conclude this way with a, a final appeal, perhaps a benediction, as we'll see here in a moment. Uh, but this, do- this section does sound a little bit like Paul. It's not enough to convince me, and most, most uh, scholars don't believe uh, that it's enough to convince them either. Um, but whoever the author of Hebrews... Uh, is, he concludes in a similar way to the way that Paul finishes his letters. He asks for prayer. Um, it sounds like he's perhaps imprisoned. It's, it, it sounds as if he is uh, he's looking to be restored. It says in verse 19, I especially urge you to do this, that I may be restored to you the sooner. So he gives a, close, a closing uh, final appeal here. In verse 20, he says, Now may the God of peace, who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. We have this benediction, a, a prayer uh, that he offers here, and it's. Um, I've always thought it was very interesting how he concludes the book here because it's almost as if he's trying to trick us <laughs> into thinking that he's done. Uh, and he says, you know, to whom be glory forever and ever, amen. And that really sounds like the end of a book, doesn't it? And then he says, actually, I've got one last thing. So if verses 18 through 21 were PS, I guess this would be PSS or PPS or whatever. I don't know, whatever it would be. Uh, but verse 22 um, are the final greetings. Again, very, very Paulish here. I appeal to you, brethren, bear with the word of exhortation, for I have written to you in few words, although this is one of the longest books in the New Testament, know that our brother Timothy has been set free, with whom I shall see you if he comes shortly. Greet all those who rule over you and all the saints. Those from Italy greet you. Grace be with you all. Amen. So he has the, the final greetings, the, the final postscript here uh, again, our brother Timothy referenced here uh, would have had you know Timothy I'm sure had more than one friend okay uh, we we see Timothy and we automatically associate him with Paul uh, but I'm sure that they had a, the the author had uh, and Paul had a, a mutual friend uh, in Timothy but these are the the final considerations I, I've titled the that the the final practical considerations. But as we, as we wrap up this book, I, I just want to take a final moment here and walk through quickly a couple of the, uh, the key themes from the book. And nothing, again, these are all things even that I've already mentioned tonight. Uh, but just to kind of finish this out. Um, first of all, Jesus is better. If we remember, if you remember nothing else from, from this series that has been interspersed. first, throughout the, uh, the last year and a half, uh, I hope that, that you would remember that nothing and no one ever will come close to our Savior. Um, he is the best possible Savior that we could have. He has endured every possible affliction that we could endure. Uh, he has been tempted in all points, like as we are yet without sin. Um, he is our great High priest, and we in him we have everything that we need. He went before us. Um, he lived a sinless life, and he is better than anything that you can compare him to. Um, and the author has gone at great lengths to prove that, and has done so adequately. Um, the the 2020 song that the Wilds put out last year when we were at the Wilds, they, they every year they teach us a new song, and. Um, they write a new song, you know, they, they usually have a new album every year or whatever you want, a new CD. Um, 
And the song that they taught us last year is called Jesus is Better. And the chorus says, Jesus is greater than any wealth achieved. Jesus is brighter than fame received. Jesus is stronger than sin's captivity. Jesus is better. He's all I need. And if you remember nothing else from this series, I trust that you will remember that Jesus is better. He is the only way of salvation. If you are sitting here tonight and you are trusting in anything other than Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross for your salvation, you are trusting in something that is not as good as Jesus, and it's not going to do it. Jesus says that in John fourteen six, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. Our world today, they are looking to everything except Jesus Christ for salvation. They are trying to find salvation, trying to find fulfillment, trying to find happiness, trying to find eternal security or any kind of security at all in everything except for Jesus Christ. And he is the only way. He is better. The other main theme I, that I'd like to mention tonight is, is something we've already discussed tonight, but it's come up time and time again. And this theme is for us as believers. And that is the theme of perseverance. That is the theme of, of endurance, of keeping on going and, and standing firm and holding fast. And those are the words that he uses time and again throughout this book. Continue on. Press forward. The last verse of the song that I just mentioned says, In Jesus now my heart can rest and lay each weight aside to run the race he's given and keep him as my only prize. His grace alone sustains me, so I never will resign. To be like him through trial and test and cross the finish line. To keep on going. To press forward. To run the race that he has given. And and his grace alone, it says, sustains me so I will never resign. I will never give up. I will never stop running. Folks, we don't know what tomorrow is going to hold. We don't know the difficulty that tomorrow is going to bring. But if at the first sign of difficulty, if we are carried away, if our faith wavers, if at the first difficult, or tr- difficult thing or trial that the Lord brings into our life, if all of a sudden it's like, well, I, we're throwing up our hands and saying, well, I don't know what this is all about, but where are you now, Lord? Folks, His grace sustains us. So we never will resign. We never have to give up. We can press on. We can continue. We can persevere. Perhaps you have been tempted to, to give up. Maybe you've thought about quitting in one way or another. Maybe you've thought about giving up on this whole Christian thing altogether. Perhaps you've thought about throwing in the towel. Perhaps you've thought about quitting. Perhaps discouragement has has set in. And if that is the case, then I would just encourage you tonight, do not quit. Allow the fact that you have an unchanging Savior to sustain you. He's he's not any different today than he was yesterday. You know, our feelings, they, 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 they go up and down. Man, we have great days. The world is great. Sun's shining. Birds are chirping. Everything's wonderful. And in the next moment, it could be the tiniest little thing. But man, all of a sudden, it's just, oh, everything's awful. And that shouldn't be the case. He's not any different. He, he, he says yesterday, today, and forever, Jesus is the same. He doesn't change. And his grace is going to sustain you just as much today as it did yesterday. Keep going. Press forward. Keep doing what you know is right. Take that next right step. God is going to honor that kind of perseverance in your life. Lastly, uh, you know, and this is really where the rubber rubber meets the road tonight. If, if we have such a wonderful Savior, then why in the world are we not telling people about it? I mean, folks, if he really is better than any wealth achieved if he's really better than any fame received, if he's really stronger than sin's captivity, if he's really all you need, then why aren't we telling anybody? Why are we keeping the message to ourselves? What are we afraid of? In verse 5, he says, He himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. What do we have to be afraid of? Why aren't we sharing the gospel? 
And why are we still looking to other things? Other people, other relationships, other, other, other stuff in this world that we know. I mean, we've done it. We've experienced it. We know it's not going to satisfy. But yet we get that next new, new little thing or we see that and we think, oh, and we covet. We think, oh, I've got to have that. That's Man, I'm going to feel good. That's going to satisfy. That's going to make me feel better. No, oh, Jesus is better. And, and, and those things, they're not going to satisfy. Why are we still looking to those things as if they're somehow going to satisfy us? They won't. I've said from the beginning of this series that I, I don't think that there is a better theme for the book of Hebrews than these verses right here. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. I said that hesitatingly at first because I didn't know. I thought maybe, you know, we'll get somewhere in this book that I'll think, wow, that's, that might be a better theme verse, but I don't think so. These verses right here, I think, encapsulate the entirety of this book. And so thus, I want to finish with it tonight. Hebrews 4, verses 14 through 16. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast. Persevere. Let us hold fast to our confession. Why? For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. There's not a one of us in this room this tonight that does not need to daily come boldly before the throne of grace because there is not a moment that we do not need to find grace to help in time of need. We are always in need. We must always be coming boldly. Why? How do we come before God? We come before because of our great high priest, Jesus Christ, who has gone before us. He has paved the way for us. We have been given everything that we need in, in Jesus. He is truly a better sacrifice. He is a better high priest. And he is our great Savior.